My sense is, is there something about the adventure of active hope that you'd like to step into? Is, is that right? It's kind of something intriguing, interesting, attractive. And um, I put here as a subtitle, deepening a sense of purpose through cultivating our desire and capacity to make a difference in the world. And what I'm doing here is that I'm bringing together two different purposes. So one purpose that Schumacher College has been deeply involved in really ever since it's been around is about strengthening our ability to make a difference in the world. And also in that, it's also strengthening our ability to live a deeply satisfying life. And those two strands, one more about the world and one more about me or about us, are sometimes seen as clashing. There's the idea of there are things that you do to, for personal development, for increasing personal well-being and happiness. And then there are things that you do about the world. And I don't know whether you sense this sometimes, but I think that the purpose of acting for our world is often seen as a miserable occupation. Is, is that your sense? And just as an example of this, I, I, gave, um, I was due to give a talk quite recently um, at a place called the School of Life in London, where I, I do regular sessions on resilience training that are very popular. And then I thought, well, OK, well, let's take a bigger step with resilience. Look at our resilience of our civilization. So I had a session called Facing Global Crisis. It got cancelled for lack of interest. They hardly had any bookings at all. And there's something about, so just recognizing that. And yet at the same time, my favorite equation is one plus one equals two and a bit. When you get synergy between different elements, when you bring these two purposes together, what it can lead to is what deep ecologist philosopher Arnie Ness talked about as the beautiful life. The beautiful life is one that's good for you and the world. And so that's really what I want to talk to. How do we live into a beautiful life that's good for ourselves and also the world? And um, just thinking about that title, Facing Global Crisis, you know, I, I was kind of thinking about it afterwards. I thought, maybe I, I was a bit strong. <laughs> and um, maybe I should have um, um, met titles. I, I just want to check something out with you just on, on words like global crisis and things like that. I'd just like to start, if we start with the world purpose, I'd like to, with you, get your sense of how bad things are, how serious, how severe the problems are that we face. So I'm going to suggest that we do this as a problemometer. And a problemometer is just a problem scale where over on one side, that's over there, is no problem at all. And over on here is, it's so catastrophic, the spelling just went out the window. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's really dire. So, and, and you can do this with your hands. So over here, like over here, this is like no problem at all, fine. You know, basically all this stuff about global crisis, it's all a bit overblown. And over here is like, this is the worst. This is a 0 to 10 scale. So over here is 10 out of 10, like the worst kind of, catastrophe that we are either in or heading towards and I, I, I don't know where would you place yourself so this is kind of like you know the dark curtain and over there is the blue chair of peacefulness not really worried at all um, so okay so this is a problemometer and, and this is really interesting to see I actually get a much better view than all of you do but if you turn around you can see where other people's hands are And if I had a picture, I'd love to take that. And, and obviously, we've all got different eyes and ears. We're all part of the eyes and ears of the world. And we all see things slightly differently. So it's good that there is some diversity. And also within the diversity, if I was to put an average of your hands, I'd probably put it about there. That was my sense of the average from what I saw. And, and obviously, there's a range. Um, and... What I'd also like to do is, and that, that's a problemometer, I'd like to do um, a responseometer. So um, this is your assessment of how well developed our societies, 
um, civilization's response to those kinds of problems when we look out at the world. So if there are kind of the problemometer there, so over here is, is no response at all. And over here is a widespread, inspiring, empowered, creative, like really as, as, as good as it could go, really. So that's 10 out of 10, you know, fantastic, inspiring response. And over here is no response at all. And, and there might be a whole spectrum between those things. Maybe here is like halfway there. Um, what's your sense? The response ometer. <laughs> ah. And if it goes very far this way, you could even kind of go to sleep. <laughs> um, uh, but that's the sense I get. But it's really interesting because I've done this with quite a few different groups in, in different places. This is the response ometer. And practically everywhere I've done this, I, I, I've, I've seen a, a mismatch. That on the whole problem, it's kind of seven or more out of 10 um, on average. And obviously with a range, depending what we look at. And responsometer usually between about two and three on average. And that average hides a huge amount of variation. Because I'm sure some of you are aware of, and probably, I'm guessing, at times yourself experience that your own response is empowered, is inspired, is creative. There'll be times when you really feel, yes, you know, I'm really there. And sometimes I feel like that. But I also know for myself that it fluctuates. And uh, I think there's a challenge here. There's a challenge for our whole society of how do we mobilize an inspired, creative response. So when we talk about the adventure of active hope, that's really where I want to start from. And also just to acknowledge that looking at these two does look a bit dismal, really. And it could be seen as what I'm going to call a going nowhere story. A going nowhere story is, here's the main character. The main character, it might be you know, us as a human race, or it might be you as a person, or it might be a group of people. The call to adventure is the motivational tug that pulls you to do something or go somewhere. So it's key part. Of, it's, it's where a plot will take off in a story. But also, really good stories always crash into something. Also, really bad stories often do too. And what can happen is a story can crash into something and it can get derailed at that point. And what we've been looking at this week in the course Positive Psychology for the Planet is really the link here to personal well-being because a one common way of understanding how depression develops, what is known as the learned helplessness model developed by Martin Seligman, is that when we have part of us that really wants to do something, but it keeps bumping into blocks, after a while it wears us down. It wears us down to the point where we have a resignation, a contraction of our energy, a kind of looking down, and in a way that, that's very similar to what happens with depression. That if somebody is living a story that's constantly bumping into blocks, you can, they can inhabit a state of resignation. And this is what often happens in relation to world problems. The Mental Health Foundation did a big survey a few years ago asking people how they felt about world problems. And the commonest response was powerlessness. The commonest response, 56% of people felt there wasn't much that they could do. And even to the point where some people said they don't even want to think about the future because they find it, it just too um, depressing. So uh, this is kind of where we're starting from, just saying this is part of the landscape. It's not only whatever problems it is we face, climate change, species extinction, widening gulf between the very rich and the rest of the world, um, but it's also the blocked response to that and, and that kind of going nowhere story. And I'm kind of not surprised that suicides and depression are rising. And, and this is only one part of the story, but more, more when in a time of uncertainty, a time where people are facing incredible economic as well as the world uncertainties, that the idea that I'd love to do something but I can't um, leads people to a very depressed state. So I'm starting from the point of gloom, <laughs> which is how many adventure stories begin. <laughs> 
And I just want to play with these two words, restore and restory. <coughs> because you can look at the same thing in a different frame and you can make something different from it. And that's really a core idea in resilience training, that it's not just what happens, but it's also the story you tell yourself about it, the story you see yourself as living. And so if I kind of go back to the gloom, just back there just a moment, and I just wonder how many of you can think of stories, great stories that you've loved to read that have started from that place. Hands up if that's familiar to you. Great story. It had a pretty depressing beginning. Um, I'm thinking here, I'm a great fan of Harry Potter. Does anyone else do that <laughs> Harry Potter thing? Um, uh, and Harry Potter began in the cupboard under the stairs. Well, you could just say, oh, that's just children's fiction. But actually, stories like that have been told for perhaps, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, stories where at the beginning it seems really difficult and hopeless, but something in the story changes. There's a kind of turning that takes place. And those stories are not just told for entertainment reasons. They're also told because they transmit an important teaching about resilience. So we're going to be playing around with that, that idea of, OK, um, how would it be to think of ourselves as inhabiting a um, story of um, adventure in these times? And there's all kinds of things that get in the way of that. And perhaps one of the biggest is the dominant story, the dominant story um, that you can think of as business as usual. The business as usual is, well, we don't need to increase our response because there's not really a great deal to respond to. Um, the business as usual assessment of the problem is like, well, OK, there's some economic hiccups, but we'll probably get over them soon and get back to the business of growth. The business as usual storyline is based on the idea that we can carry on doing our business the way we usually do. Now, it's interesting here because I'm a great fan of um, looking at um, the way stories go, and particularly the work of Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell was somebody who, probably familiar to many of you here, he studied stories from all around the world. And one of the things he talked about was stories usually begin from a kind of like ordinary place, an ordinary place, and we can think of that as business as usual. But then the way the stories develop is that there's very often some major threat that happens to a community. And we can think of that as the, the next part of the story. And it's, it's moving into a different story, the idea that um, things are falling apart. Things are falling apart in our world. And it was David Corton who, in his book, The Great Turning, he talked about this as the great unraveling. I, I, I find this a really helpful term. There's business as usual. I can carry on the way I normally do. And then there's a great unravelling. It's like another story that emerges. And you can get stuck in the story. You can get stuck in the story that things are falling apart and there's not much we can do. I've come across, I don't know if any of you have too, but come across the idea that basically our world is dying and there's not much we can do. It's gone too far already. Is this kind of complete fiction, or have you come across this too? We perhaps even feel it sometimes, think it sometimes. It's hmm? a dominant meme. It's a dominant meme. And so we have two dominant memes that are coexisting at the same time. One is, things are fine. And another is, things are so far gone that there's not much we can do. And it's, it's possible to have both of these memes, these kind of thought streams, happening in you at the same time which is really confusing. It leads to a kind of split inside. And I notice it myself because I notice there's times where I'm in the business as usual mode. I think about my pension and you know what's going to happen and things like that. And there are also times where I kind of scratch my head and think, you know, is there going to be a pension around? You know, is that is that is that kind of thing, is there that certainty that these things are, are going to be there? And and just that feeling that we're getting closer and closer to an edge of a cliff and that we might well fall over. So that's the story of the great unravelling. And what I like about adventure stories is the way the main 
characters respond. Because they're, they come out of the ordinary world, they come out of a business as usual, they face the unravelling, and they may want to kind of hide away, but there's some point at which they say, OK, I'm going to do something about this. And I've very one of my most important teachers has been Joanna Macy, who's done so much to popularise this term, perhaps another dominant meme too, this idea that there is a story in our times that we can call a great turning. And you're part of it just by being here uh, this, this evening, that there is this larger story of we know that there's the business as usual. We can feel horrified by where that's leading. But also, we live at a time where there is a massive, widespread response. I'm thinking of Paul Hawkins' book, Blessed Unrest, where he was trying to count up the number of organisations involved acting for social and ecological justice. And he kind of basically lost count, really. He felt, I think it was something like, well, maybe it's hundreds of thousands, or maybe it's a million or more. That's just the numbers of organisations. And that this is a um, huge diversity of different aspects of that story. And that's what I want to um, play into, really, that um, saying, well, if there is this story around, and um, one way of thinking about it that I find helpful is to, um, is to think of different ways that, that the future can go. And if there was a massive, you know, if we really got our responsometer, like, really over there, and there was a massive, widespread, uh, creative response which is kind of what's needed in our times, then maybe future generations will look back on this period in history and they'll look back and they'll tell stories about the time of the Great Turning. Just as in a similar way that we might now look back and tell stories about the Great Scientific Revolution or the Renaissance or the abolition of the slave trade or, or, the, or the suffragettes, that these were periods of time where really big, important changes took place. And I think um, the abolition of the slave trade is an interesting one because it started on a really small scale. If you read about Thomas Clarkson, I think it was, what, 1785? He was a student at Cambridge, and he wrote an essay. He wrote an essay about the slave trade, and it so disturbed him, it so distressed him, caused him so much anguish that he made a decision at that point, I'm going to do something about it. But there weren't many people who were doing much about it, and the campaign started in, it was like a tiny little um, room in a London print shop. I think there was like about 12 people who came along to a meeting. And although it had some initial success, it kind of grew a bit, there was a period in time where, um, because of the kind of war with France, there was like real repression going on. I think it was something like that if, it, it basically became illegal to have gatherings of more than a certain number of people and that they, they actually closed the office for the campaign for the abolition of the slave trade. And for about seven <coughs> years or so, a certain number of years, they actually stopped having meetings. Thomas Clarkson had a nervous breakdown. You know, that, that there was a kind of like a rising up and then it really fell down. And we know how the story went from there. We know that actually things picked up and then it was only a number of decades later that a law was passed in Parliament, what was it, 1807 or something like that. And so... When I am feeling that sense of, oh, you know, the great unravelings happening, there's not much chance for us, I find it very helpful to have those historical reference points that great changes have happened in the past that seemed impossible at certain points in their history. We don't know where things will go from here, but let's just play into, let's lean into this story that we are living in the time of the great turning. In fact, you know, it's, 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 it's not something you have to lean into so much because it is happening. All three of these stories are happening. You can see business as usual happening. You can see the great unravelling happening. You can certainly see evidence of it happening. And the fact that we're here this evening and there are all these wonderful courses at places like um, Schumacher College and I'm in Totnes, that kind of birthplace of um, the transition movement in the UK, you know, I was there in 2006. I was invited to speak with Rob Hopkins at the launch of Transition Town Totnes in 2006. Like, wow, what a place. You know, this is a hubbling and bubbling of the great turning. But also with stories, 
there's like an inside, perhaps this rug here is like, I'm in the story, I'm in the story of the great turning, I'm kind of inspired by it, my responsometer is going that way. But you can also be outside the story too. And you might notice from your own experience of times when you've been really in something and also times when you've been on the outside. And I think it's a really key question for our time is, what helps us? What helps us step inside? And I'd like to offer, um, offer some things that might help that, offer some things that might help this understanding of this process of how can we step inside a story we really have our heart in, a story that's going somewhere we deeply want to go. And I think of this story as the adventure of active hope because it's about how we um, identify what we hope for, starting where we are. But also, there's a, we don't know that it will work out. There's a great uncertainty there. But it's like we're willing to jump into it and, and give it a try, saying, well, OK, what will help that? What will help that process? And something that I find helps is this idea, psychological term. They talk about it as the growth mindset the growth mindset. I, I've, I've written about this in my book, Find Your Power. I've talked about it as process thinking. Process thinking, the idea that everything is in a process of continual change. However things are at one point in time, that's just how they are at one point in time. At one point in time, it looked pretty gloomy and unlikely for Thomas Clarkson, but we know how that evolved. Um, the, the, life is a process of continual change and we don't know where things are. The idea of the growth mindset is that um, however things are now, they can change. But also, if we were to look at things like our ability to grow into a story and step into a story, we can cultivate, we can grow the story of, of the great turning. So here's me having like a brief, like, where am I in this larger process here? <laughs> and, and actually, that's really on cue, because what I wanted to say here is that when we're in this story of the great turning, confusion can be part of the journey. <laughs> I didn't plan my moment of confusion there. It just came anyway. Um, but but it, uh, what I like about this thing about every moment is a frame in a movie film is that however you're feeling, you know, you may not feel inspired. You may not feel very um, kind of empowered. And it's like saying, OK, this is where I am now. But how can I cultivate the qualities that will help me? How can I cultivate the qualities that will help me? So, and there's something here about also the story we tell ourselves about feeling upset. That sometimes you may look at the news and you may feel your stomach tighten. You may find it difficult to sleep at night. And one story you can tell is oh, perhaps i better go and see my doctor. I've got symptoms of depression. And, you know, and sometimes that's a useful story, but sometimes it can be a blocking story for what I call good depression. Good depression is where you feel so bad about something that it inspires you to act to change it. And I worked for nearly 20 years as an addiction specialist in Bristol, and the clients who had good depression... I saw it as a really positive sign. It's the same as good anxiety, too. And another term for it is inspirational dissatisfaction. It, it, can, be, it can be what sparks the desire of, I'm so fed up with this, I really want to change it. But also, when you want to change it, that's like one step. It's like, OK, I've got the desire, I've got the will, but I can't see the way. And I think wanting to change is the starting point. And then if you find yourself confused, it probably means you've stepped out of your previous story of certainty. And that's a positive step. That if you're feeling confused, confusion is a growth stage. And I think of like snakes when they move from, when they shed skins, they, they have a kind of period where they're in their skin and they're comfortable and then it gets a bit tight and they move out of it. And while their next skin is growing, they have this awkward, vulnerable phase where they may feel um, rather raw and, and I think of that as a bit like the confusion, <coughs> confusion stage. We can move between feelings of relative certainty. And actually, it's very constructive when we're not too attached to kind of knowing how things should be. So, and crisis in, is, in, is in there too. 
that perhaps crisis is um, certainly thinking of addictions recovery, the idea of hitting bottom. Hitting rock bottom can be a key turning point, a key change time. But just when things go wrong is not always the same as hitting bottom. You can also have masking rock bottom. Masking rock bottom is where the crash happens, but somehow it doesn't activate the alarm. And I think what we've been doing, what we've been doing today as a group is what I think of as raising rock bottom. Raising rock bottom is when we give ourselves a space to feel the alarm that might normally just be a bit pushed back in our mind or a bit pushed down in our heart. That we, when we make space to feel the alarm that is in there, it activates us. And there's a lovely phrase here, pre-traumatic growth. Pre-traumatic growth is where our alarm about a trauma or crash further down the road activates in us a, resp in a, a response that we can either prevent or reduce the, the, the trauma from happening. So we're, we're restoring, telling ourselves different stories about the experience of distress, the experience of confusion, and the experience of crisis, saying maybe they're key points in the story. But in terms of how do we step into the story of the great turning, the story of active hope, what I find very helpful is to consider story structure. And I wanted to offer this evening a tool that I found really helpful. It's called Six-Part Story Method. And I'm going to invite you to reflect on this in relation to your lives, where you are in your story. Six-Part Story Method is um, perhaps just a, it's just a way of thinking of the structure of stories, that you start, a story is always about someone or something. So this might be the story about you, might be the story about us. And then there is a call to adventure. Uh, the call to adventure is the motivation, in, motivating impulse that wants to go somewhere or do something. And that can sometimes be excitement and enthusiasm and inspiration of a positive vision you, you want to move towards. But it can also be that inspirational dissatisfaction. It can also be the good depression or the good anxiety that says, I'm fed up with this. I, 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 I can't stand this carrying on any longer. But also, we've talked about the impulse hitting um, a bock. The bock is the bump or crash. And what I like about seeing that as just part of the story structure is that when you bump into something, you can just go, OK, that's my bock for today. That's my bock. That's my bump or crash for today. Our lives will always have them. But what really makes the difference between a going nowhere story and a going somewhere story is the second layer, the second layer of the story. And the second layer has helping factors. In any great story, the main character bumps into something where it seems impossible until. It seems impossible until, and it might be um, they bump into like a wise old person in the woods or a wise young person in the woods or an antelope or a, you know, whatever it is, they bump into something that acts as a helping factor. And that part of our task in our stories is to seek out, to seek out these helping factors which can lead to a turning point, that's our hope, um, in a way that leads to our hoped for outcome. So I think of this story, I think of um, what we've been looking at in, in our course, we started this morning, looking at inspiring examples, inspiring examples that have been through this process. And uh, I've talked about an inspiring example of Thomas Clarkson. I think, you know, such an important reference point in history. This is a story about Thomas Clarkson. He wrote his essay when he was at Cambridge. He was just a student. He said, I really want to do something about this but then bumped into enormous challenges, enormous vested interests that were tied up with the um, slave trade. But he found other people. And this is like, in terms of helping factors, a really key one is um, who else is around? That thing about background music, also really helpful factor. <laughs> um, for me, I'm a musician, so it really, one of the things I draw on. But, but also finding a merry gang, finding company, recruiting support around you. And, and I think that if we see this, this is part of our work. We need to look at what are the helping factors that nourish, and, and what is it that's nourished? 
What is it that's nourished? I want to move on to um, how we... I, I like this here. You see that responsometer? That's what we want to happen. <laughs> there. And, and in order for that to happen, um, we need to have this thing, I call it neitaflo. <laughs> and we need a new language because there isn't the language around there about, you know, being politically inspired and, you know, to act for our world. Um, neitaflo um, is an abbreviation. What it stands for is it's, it's a state. It's a state that you can be in. And there's times when you're, you're not so much in it and there's times you can be in it. You can inhabit a state of neitaflo, being neitaflo. What, what I mean by that, it's when you're nourished, energised, empowered and inspired to act for life on earth. Do you like that? Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, so that's, that's what we've been doing with positive psychology for the planet. We've been looking at how we cultivate, how we cultivate neitaflo. And I want to come back to the growth mindset. The growth mindset, it might be in that strip or film, film strip. There might be some frames where you think, oh, I haven't got much of that. But the question is, is would you like to? Would you like some of that? And this is why I'm really interested. I talked about these two threads. There's the changing the world thread, but there's also having a happier, more fulfilling life thread as well. Because the research on happiness tends to point to people being much happier and more fulfilled when they're really with their neitaflo. <laughs> that, um, and I know that term hasn't quite come into the mainstream <laughs> psychological studies yet. I think it could, you know. I think it could, if any of you fancy doing some studies here. But it, it's, um, there's good research that, for example, people living lives of voluntary simplicity have higher levels of satisfaction than those who score high on scales of materialism. There's very good research that actually giving is more enjoyable than having in relation to money. They did a piece of research where people unexpectedly found a whole load of money and, or as part of a study, and, and some of them were instructed to spend it and some of them were ex uh, instructed to give it. And those who gave it away actually um, felt much happier afterwards. Um, there's good research that people who volunteer uh, volunteering is associated with higher levels of, of um, satisfaction in life. You know, there's lots of research around this, but uh, I, th I think it's, it's also, it's like saying this is the missing element in the whole climate change debate. <coughs> I don't know whether you've ever been to a march for Nii Taflo, have you? <laughs> what do we want? Nii Taflo! When do we want it? Now! Should we do it? What do we want? Nii Taflo! When do we want it? Now! OK, well, may want it now, but there may be a journey to getting there. But it's back to the growth mindset. And here's, here's a thought here. I think we need to train ourselves. I think we need to train ourselves, and I think of three bits of change. There's knowing about the problem, that's awareness. There's knowing about the practical, inspired steps to take. That's the action. But between those two is the middle bit of change. And in that middle bit of change are the stories that we live in, our <coughs> desires, our belief about whether it's possible. And it's in that middle bit of change that we can do things to grow our neita flow. And if we see it as a piece of training, and I'm thinking here of Roger Bannister, Roger Bannister, who is the first recorded person to run the four-minute mile. Who knows if other people did before? But he didn't just train physically. He also trained psychologically, too. He also looked at the ways that he constructed barriers in his mind and looked at ways of um, uh, uh, challenging, challenging those. And Olympic athletes as well. You know, sports psychology is a really growth field. They look at how we can really understand to give our best performance, to really give our best response. Now, here's a thought. What do you think is more important? Being in the Olympics and winning there or saving the planet? <laughs> What's your thought? 
Now, okay, so Olympics. <laughs> okay, great. And diversity, you know, it's your life, your choice. Um, but if I had to choose which team to belong to, and okay, over here is the 100 meter sprint team, and some magical process meant that I could run very fast, than I, faster than I can. And over here is team of life on earth acting for the great turning. I'd, I know which team I'd want to be in. But also, if we're in this team and we accept that this is more important than running a sprint in the Olympics, think of the lengths they go to to train themselves. You know, the choices they make about what to eat, what time to go to bed, how to um, do that training every day. If we got as serious about cultivating our best response and really understanding, you know, What's, what's going to make the difference in my own personal response on It could be over here, or it could be over here. What can I do? And I love this idea of aim for progress rather than perfection. But wherever I am on this scale, how can I really look after my knee itaflo? How can I see that as part of the work of working for our world? So this is what we've been doing. We've been going into training. We've been having mindfulness training with Cara Jewell yesterday afternoon. Mindfulness, really valuable skill. And we heard about a headline in the papers just this morning, this morning about mindfulness as a, um, uh, being compared with antidepressants as a treatment for depression and actually having a marginal edge in terms of like reducing the recurrence rate, relapse rate over a two year period. But also there's something about mindfulness, and I've, we, we've been looking at this in terms of the going nowhere story, that if we go back to story structure, and that idea of a going nowhere story, thing that in order to get to where you want to go, you need to start from where you are. So maybe the first step in moving into this story is just to go from nowhere to now here. So all it needs is like, instead of, if we had a little dash between the, the N and the W, if you change the, the hyphen from the N and the W, which isn't there but should be, um, if you moved it over so there's now a hyphen between the W and the H. And that's what mindfulness is about. It's about starting from now here, feeling what we feel, noticing what we notice, but then Active hope is saying, well, where from here? Where can it go from here? And I, I want to come on to active hope, and I'm just going to whiz through these there. Actually, we just go back just to enjoy that moving. See? <laughs> See that? <gasps> OK, we're going to be looking at what helps it go, dong, and then again, dong. OK. Um, this idea of active hope, and um, I just need to check. Um, how familiar you are with Star Trek? Anyone do Star Trek here? <laughs> I do Star Trek. It's one of my teaching tales. And in Star Trek, one of the things they talk about is the idea of timelines. Timelines. And timelines is like different versions of reality. And in Star Trek, they hop between them and they have like special gizmos that help them do that. I don't know whether you can do that. But what I do know or find very helpful is the idea that from any point in time, it can go loads of different ways. And if we just hold that in mind, and we remember people like Thomas Clarkson, we remember the suffragettes, we remember Nelson Mandela in prison for 27 years, those periods of time where it didn't look at all hopeful. And we think, well, OK, you know, there's the worst that can happen. But there's also, what's the best that can happen? What's our hope? And there's a different meaning of hope here. There's hope often in terms, it's, it's thought of as hopefulness. Am I hopeful? And when I look at what's happening with climate change and things, and people ask me, you know, are, are you hopeful that everything will work out OK? I'm not, actually. I don't know if that's how any of you feel. I'm not hopeful. But I am clear what I hope for. I am clear what I hope for, and that's, that's part of active hope. Step one is we start from where we are, now, here. Step two is we say, what do we hope for? 
What's our preferred timeline? And then we vote for that with our actions and our choices. Every day we'll have choice points where we could go this way, we could go that way. And one of those choice points is what we give our attention to. And what I'm wanting to encourage here is giving our attention to what helps us step into the adventure of the great turning, this story of change. And, um, and what helps us give our attention to the process of cultivating Niaita flow, the state of being nourished, energized, empowered, inspired to act for life on Earth. So even when things take a turning for the worse, as they have done and are doing, even at that point, there are still many different ways it can go. And we have this incredible uncertainty. We don't know how things will develop, but we can be clear what timeline we prefer. And then we can look for ways of saying, that's the team. That's the team that I want to be in. And I want to train myself to give my best response. Thank you.